If you're viewing this, you've clicked help on the watershed characteristics worksheet to learn more about runoff characteristics and calculation of runoff loadings in the BMP trains model. Now in general, runoff characteristics and runoff concentrations are highly variable within the state of Florida. They vary from event to event and they even vary substantially within a given rain event. Now this variability is caused by several factors such as rainfall intensity, the frequency of rainfall, the soil types, land use, weather patterns, and so forth. Uh, variability in runoff characteristics needs to be included in any monitoring protocol for runoff collection. For example, if you're collecting runoff and you're trying to estimate runoff characteristics on an annual basis, then you need to look at a wide range of runoff events and estimate runoff characteristics for each of these events. A lot of times people say, well, why can't we just use NPDES data for estimating runoff characteristics since there's a lot of that data available and data have been collected uh, throughout much of the United States. Unfortunately, the NPS, NPDES data are collected under a very specific set of criteria and do not necessarily represent runoff characteristics over an annual average cycle. So in most cases, although the NPDES data are useful for comparing characteristics from one location to the other, they're generally not useful for estimating annual runoff characteristics. Now when you look at runoff characterization data in the literature, you'll find a lot of data for suspended solids, for nutrients, uh, a fair amount of data for metals, uh, but the metals tend to be mostly zinc, lead, and copper, and the land uses tend to be commercial, residential, and highway. When you get into the more exotic parameters, such as BOD, COD, oil and grease, uh, and particularly pathogens, the data availability becomes uh, much less, uh, and, and many of these are infrequently measured in runoff studies. Now, runoff characteristics are used in many engineering analyses, including pollutant loading analyses, which is what the BMP trains model does. It's also used in TMDL calculations and in pre and post evaluations. Runoff concentrations are commonly expressed in terms of an EMC, which means an event mean concentration. Now, that doesn't necessarily reflect the concentration at any particular time during the event, but it's defined as the total pollutant loading for your parameter of interest generated during the event divided by the runoff volume. And when you extend this to an annual EMC value, you are defining the EMC as the annual pollutant loading divided by the annual runoff volume. It doesn't necessarily represent the measured EMC value for any particular event, simply an estimate of the annual loading divided by the annual rainfall or the annual runoff volume. Now to do this generally requires a minimum of seven to ten events collected over a range of conditions. The, the first look at defining runoff characteristics within the state of Florida was done by ERD in 1990 to support the Tampa Bay swim plan. And at that time, an extensive literature review was conducted to identify runoff EMC values for single land use categories in Florida. We identified about 100 studies, and each study was evaluated for the adequacy of the data, the validity of the data, the length of the study, and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, of those 100 studies, we had to eliminate about 60 of them because they did not meet one of the selection criteria uh, 
for inclusion in the database. There are many excellent studies that have been done to characterize runoff, which include multiple land uses and not a single land use, which is what we need to identify runoff characteristics. So we developed this initial database, and the EMC values in this database were calculated as simple arithmetic means. Uh, the database defined common land use categories in the category, the pre-development categories of agriculture, open space slash forest, mining, wetlands, open water and lakes, and post-development categories of low uh, density residential, single family residential, multifamily residential, low and high intensity commercial, industrial and highway. Now, a frequent question that uh, engineers ask is, can you use flux codes to identify land uses with respect to runoff characteristics? And the answer for that generally is no. Flux codes are too specific in most cases to uh, have available runoff characterization data for the specificity included in the flux codes. They also uh, don't necessarily uh, group land uses together which have similar runoff uh, loading generation potential. For example, mobile home parks, which actually have a relatively low uh, runoff loading potential, are often grouped in with multifamily residential, which have a much higher runoff potential. So, uh, the flux codes are not generally useful for identifying land uses uh, with respect to runoff EMCs. So we have developed the following land use category descriptions uh, which are used to define land use types that would be grouped into each of these categories. Now they would be grouped in terms of their runoff loading potential, not necessarily in terms of their visual appearance or hydrologic characteristics. This is an example of the available database with respect to single-family residential runoff. Currently there are 17 studies in the single-family residential database. All of them have listed values for total nitrogen and total phosphorus. Most of them have BOD and suspended solids. But when you get into the metals, uh, the availability of data become less. At the bottom of the table, we have provided mean values, median values, and log normal mean values. Now, the mean values were used in early databases. Uh, later databases make use of the median values and log normal mean values because these more accurately reflect the measure of central tendency for uh, widely uh, uh, separated data sets such as runoff characteristics. Another thing I would point out that's very interesting, if you look at lead concentrations in runoff, up until about uh, the late 1980s, lead concentrations were extremely high. After lead was removed from gasoline, concentrations dropped dramatically, and now most of the time uh, we, we have difficulty finding lead in residential runoff. These are examples of the available data for low intensity commercial and high intensity commercial. Low intensity commercial uh, is defined as uh, perhaps uh, office parks uh, or shop, uh, shopping centers, strip malls that uh, have a relatively low level of activity. High intensity commercial would be regional malls, downtown areas, and other areas which exhibit uh, a very high traffic loading on a daily basis. There are a number of studies available for highway characterization data. Again, uh, all of them provide nitrogen and phosphorus data. Uh, a lot of the highway studies also include metals and notice again uh, almost the complete removal of lead from runoff uh, following removal of lead from gasoline. 
If we look at the database over the years, this is, these are the number of studies that we had in the original one in 1994. It was updated, updated again in 2003, updated again in 2007, and again uh, more recently in about uh, 2012. Notice that the number of highway uh, studies has increased. Uh, the number of single-family residential studies has increased. Uh, and before, there was very little information available for undeveloped land, and now we have an extensive uh, database for uh, natural land areas. If we compare the original values, uh, the, the 2007 values, with the revised values from 2012, uh, you'll notice that in most cases, concentrations have decreased slightly for most of these land uses. These decreases are due to two things. First, uh, we have been observing a general decrease in concentrations in runoff over the years as more people become aware of the uh, impacts of their personal activities on runoff characteristics. Secondly, the original values were calculated as arithmetic means, whereas the revised values are calculated as geometric means, which tends to produce a slightly lower value since it eliminates the significance of very large values that may be in the data set. This is a comparison of typical nitrogen concentrations in stormwater for different land uses. And a line is drawn here that illustrates a typical natural area concentration. Notice that as development occurs, nitrogen concentrations exhibit a one to two-fold increase for most land uses. If we look at phosphorus, again, we have a line representing a typical natural area concentration. But for phosphorus, we see three to tenfold increases for most uh, land uses following development compared with natural area concentrations. As I mentioned previously, a natural area monitoring project was conducted during 2008 to 2010 to specifically look at the runoff characteristics of natural lands within the state of Florida. Prior to this study, there were only three or four data points available for natural land areas in the EMC database, and two of the three or four studies were not even conducted within the state of Florida. So FDEP funded a study to characterize the runoff generated from natural undeveloped land communities within the state of Florida. We installed a total of 33 automated monitoring sites in 10 state parks because it was determined that the state parks would provide the best opportunity to monitor lands which had not been impacted by development activities. Over the 14-month period, we collected a total of 318 samples at the 33 automated monitoring sites. These sites were located throughout the state of Florida, from the Panhandle all the way down uh, to extreme southern portions of the state, and each of these parks contained different unique land use characteristics. This is a summary of upland land use classifications within the state of Florida, and the ones that are highlighted in uh, the, the tan color are categories that were included in the monitoring efforts uh, which were conducted. So you can see that over 92% of all the natural area land uses in Florida were covered in this monitoring project. Ones which were not covered, the coastal strand, sand hills, tropical hardwood hammocks, uh, are either low on the list for development pressure or contain a very little land area within the state. I've provided pictures here for some of our natural area monitoring sites. This is the mixed hardwood forest community that we monitored at uh, Alfred McClay Gardens uh, Park in Tallahassee. Uh, 
Notice that uh, it uh, consists of hardwood with a fairly open understory, uh, although there is vegetation on the forest floor. This is our monitoring equipment, which uh, we set up adjacent to uh, small ravines uh, that develop naturally in these areas to drain runoff. Uh, the Favor Dykes State Park monitoring site, Mesic Flatwoods. Uh, again, a sort of a wet area dominated by uh, pine and, and, and other uh, uh, forest type uh, uh, communities with a with very dense understory. And again, monitoring was conducted in depressional areas and ravines where the runoff would accumulate. Jonathan Dickinson State Park, wet flatwoods, which are very common throughout the state of Florida. These are basically uh, pine forests with an understory of palmetto uh, and, and other uh, smaller uh, grasses. Uh, they become flooded and wet during portions of the year, provide habitat for a wide variety of species. One benefit of using these state parks is that the natural communities have already been established and defined. Uh, we could simply, if we wanted to monitor inside uh, an upland hardwood forest, which is indicated by symbol 20, we would simply go to areas identified by that on the map, and it was very easy for us to specifically locate the areas that we wanted to study. Here's, a, here's another upland hardwood, a ruderal upland pine forest. This is an area that used to be a, an orange grove and is transitioning into uh, a forest. A strand swamp in Fakahatchee. An upland mixed forest in San Falasco, which is near Gainesville. And Mayaka River State Park, which is a dry prairie, uh, dominated again by uh, grasses and uh, uh, smaller type species. Xeric scrub uh, is a, a community probably familiar to everyone, uh, a sand pine community uh, typically dominated with a weak understory uh, because of the uh, low nutrient content of the soil and lack of moisture due to high infiltration rates. This is a summary of, of the uh, runoff characteristics from each of the natural areas that we monitored. Nitrogen concentrations ranged from a little less than 2,000 micrograms per liter to about uh, 288 micrograms per liter in the mixed hardwood forest. Notice, however, the extreme variability in total phosphorus. Several of the land uses, the marl prairie, the mesic flatwoods, wet flatwoods, wet prairie, scrubby flatwoods, had very low phosphorus concentrations. But some of the land uses, mixed hardwood forests, and particularly the upland mixed forest and the xeric hammock, had very elevated phosphorus concentrations, much higher than you would normally see in urban runoff. The reason for that is that these forests are primarily deciduous, and they contain a continually uh, decomposing layer of vegetation litter on the forest floor and as this decomposes it releases phosphorus into the runoff uh, during runoff events. So in these cases you can get very high phosphorus concentrations uh, at times. We also measured metals. I want to point out uh, the iron concentrations. Uh, the standard for iron in the state of Florida is one milligram per liter for class three recreational waters and notice that some of the natural areas had exceedances of this uh, on many occasions. Uh, these are the geometric mean values but overall the ruderal upland pine, mixed hardwood forest, and dry prairie had exceedances of the standard for iron uh, virtually in all samples. Notice again the fecal coliform standard. Uh, these are fecal coliform measurements that we conducted at each of the sites. The fecal coliform standard for uh, sites with multiple measurements in the state of Florida is 200. And notice that mesic flatwoods, scrubby flatwoods, upland mixed forest, and xeric scrub had exceedances of the coliform standard even though they were natural. 
Now obviously this is, is uh, natural uh, inputs from uh, wildlife, but again uh, there were exceedances uh, of the standard in these areas. If you want to estimate natural area loadings, you do it in a manner similar to the way you would estimate loadings from urban areas. You simply take an EMC value for your community type, multiply it by the annual runoff loading, uh, the annual runoff volume, and you get your annual loading. Let's look at an example calculation for estimating runoff loadings. Let's say that we have a a uh, typical development that consists of 90 acres of single-family residential, five acres of stormwater management systems, and five acres of preserved wetlands. The residential areas are covered with lawns in good condition, soil types in hydrologic group D. Uh, the residential areas are 25 percent impervious, three-quarters of which is DCIA, that corresponds to a DCIA percentage of 81.7 percent and a weighted curve number considering the natural area and the impervious areas which are not DCIA of 81. And depending upon whether the project is located in Pensacola, Orlando, or Key West, we've calculated runoff values for each of those areas. Notice that the runoff value for Key West is substantially lower than Orlando and Pensacola because of differences in the characteristics of individual rain events as well as the total rainfall depth. All right, under post-development conditions then, we're going to generate nutrient loadings from this 90-acre site. We estimate the nitrogen value for single-family residential at 1.87 and the phosphorus value at 0 0.301 milligrams per liter. So for Pensacola, for total nitrogen, we take the runoff, multiply through by some conversions, and then the concentration, and we estimate about 344 kilograms of total nitrogen per year. For phosphorus, we do the same thing. We take the runoff volume with some conversions, multiply it by the estimated phosphorus concentration, and we get 55.4 kilograms per year. If these projects are located in Orlando and Key West, we've also provided nitrogen and phosphorus loadings for those areas as well. Notice that both the nitrogen and phosphorus are lower in the other areas due to the lower generated runoff volumes. If we look at the pre-development loadings, Let's assume that the natural area was 60% mesic flatwood and 40% wet flatwood in fair condition. If you look in TR55, the curve number value for these areas is 79. So for each of these areas, we have a curve number 79. We input in the annual runoff. These are the calculated C values from the BMP trains model based upon the DCIA percentage of zero and the non-DCIA curve number of 79, and we get estimates of runoff volumes under pre-development conditions. Notice that these are about half of the runoff volumes generated under post-development. Now we look at the EMC values for total nitrogen and total phosphorus. The EMC value for mesic flatwoods for total nitrogen is 1,000 micrograms per liter. For wet flatwoods, it's 1,175. 60% is mesic flatwood, 40% is wet flatwoods. So that uh, results in a combined EMC of 1.07 milligrams per liter. For total phosphorus, and mesic flatwoods, we have 34 micrograms per liter and 15 micrograms per liter, which corresponds to 0 0.026 weighted average for total phosphorus. So calculating the pre-development loadings, just like we did the post-development loadings, we take the runoff volume, multiply it by the concentration, and we get 99.8 kilograms of total nitrogen per year, 
and 2.42 kilograms of total phosphorus per year. And the, lo the pre-development loadings for Pensacola, Orlando, and Key West are summarized in this table. Finally, let's look at the removal efficiencies necessary to achieve post less than pre uh, development loadings. We have our pre development loads, our post development loading of nitrogen, and the required removals, which range from 71% in Pensacola to 76% in Orlando. The same thing for total phosphorus. We have our pre development loadings, our post development loadings, and now notice for phosphorus we need removal efficiencies in the 95 to 96 percent range uh, primarily because the pre-development land uses had extremely low phosphorus concentrations. So in summary, runoff EMC values are available for a wide range of land uses within the state of Florida, both urban and natural areas, and to estimate loadings you simply need estimates of the runoff volume on an annual basis and an EMC value uh, for the particular land use. The BMP trains model does all of this for you by simply inputting your location, your annual rainfall, the physical characteristics of your project, the pre and post land use and cover, the soil types and CM values and the BMP, BMP trains model calculates the pre and post loadings uh, based upon that information.